so this this is a piece that I did. Uh, it's in the collection of the Lee Yockey Woods and Art Museum, uh, and consequently, it's never been in competition. It's never been to Ocean City, and I thought this was a golden opportunity to uh, give you a behind-the-scenes look at at it. This is not a step-by-step -step how to through it. It's it's just pictures that I had taken along the way that I've tried to put together. There's some big gaps and that sort of thing, but uh, but we're going to go through this this piece, and I'll give you a sense of of how I work and where I work. Uh, <clears throat> I live very close to uh, Carnegie Museum of Natural History's uh, field station. Uh, which has run a year round full time bird banding operation since uh, the 60s. Uh, it's very unique in that regard. And, and that's one of the reasons that I live here. It's, it's basically home for me, but uh, I see the banding lab as such a phenomenal resource uh, that, that I have ended up living very close by. And here we have. Uh, in the top left uh, picture of me, I'm working on a red-bellied woodpecker. I call up the banding lab. I say, hey, if you get a red-bellied woodpecker, I sure would like to take a look at it. They call me up with that very day. Uh, they've got one and I'm over there sketching it. Uh, the yellow throat and the solitary sandpiper down in the corner, uh, those were head studies that I did uh, in clay from life, from live birds. Uh, here I am with a, a saw-wet owl in one hand, a live bird, and the clay model that I was working on, kind of a comical, <laughs> comical picture while they look at each other. But the most important thing that I do there is sketch, uh, as I'm doing in the picture with the woodpeckers. This is a, a kind of a typical sketch. I, I do a lot of sketching, and uh, my sketches are split 50-50 between being in the field and sketching a bird that I'm looking at through binoculars or a scope uh, and uh, sketches that I do at the banding station where I have a bird in hand. And that changes the way I sketch. And in the field sketches, I concentrate on attitude and uh, you know the, the countenance of the bird. And when I have the bird in hand, uh, there I'm concentrating on uh, details uh, that I can't get looking through binoculars, but I can get when the bird is in hand. So this is a, a typical sketch uh, from a powder mill. Uh, that's what the little PNR refers to in the sketch, powder mill nature reserve. Uh, and it's an ASY male. Uh, ASY stands for after second year. Uh, Rose-breasted grosbeak is one of the few songbirds where you can uh, tell uh, a bit more about age than usual because they take several years to attain full adult plumage. Um, and, and what I'm after uh, when I have the bird in hand is the length of the wing, which is from the wrist to the ends of the primaries. And that's a measurement that you can look up in books, uh, uh, but it's, it's a basic measurement. And the, the wing length and then the amount of tail that extends beyond the wing. I don't care so much what the length of the tail is. I care how much tail sticks out past the wing. Uh, and then the size of the eye, you know, that tells me exactly what size glass eye I would be looking for. And then you can't, it's kind of faint here, but there's a little, a little bit of uh, uh, markings here uh, that indicate the, the difference the distance between the front corners of the eye. And with, with the eye size, the distance between the eyes, the wing length and the amount of tail that extends past the wing, that's what I need to, to make a bird. That's what I need to, to go to a clay model. Uh, and so we'll just run through a couple of other sketches. And you're gonna see the same thing in each one. Wherever you see these hash marks, that tends to mean I'm, that's an actual measurement from the, from the live bird. Uh, so once again, we have the wing length, how much tail goes beyond the wing, the eye size and the distance between the eyes. 
then if the bird is cooperative and not stressed at all, I might end up making more sketches. Here, it looks like I've measured uh, the relative distances that uh, of the exposed primaries. I might do a little character shot of the head or, or some little detail that, uh, that catches my eye. Um, here's a, a more elaborate uh, sketch of a pileated woodpecker. Uh, it's a bigger bird. The bigger birds you can handle a bit longer. Uh, the small birds will fade sooner. Uh, so you try, you know, you, you don't want to do anything to jeopardize the bird. Uh, so the wing didn't even fit on this page. I've got the measurement here, uh, 243 millimeters. But I, uh, what I want is how much tail goes beyond the primaries. And then uh, distance between the eyes and, and the eye size. Everything else is is bonus, you know. If you can get a sense of, you know, I was struck with how the bird would be calm and the crest would be a wispy little thin thing, and then when he got excited, it turned into a great big bushy thing. This is valuable information for for me as a sculptor. And there's all kinds of little little notes on there. That, uh, <clears throat> this is a Phoebe. Uh, this is a simpler page, and it is simply the wing length, tail beyond the wing. Uh, and the eye size and the distance between the eyes. And then a, a few quick little character sketches. Uh, morning dove, uh, again, uh, doves are pretty calm birds. You can handle them a little bit longer. I don't get the bird until the banding process is over. So my time is, is very brief. And sometimes I just block these sketches in and then tune them up a little bit uh, after the bird is gone, but still fresh in my mind. But this is a situation where I had the opportunity to make all kinds of measurements, you know, the tertials, the undertail coverts, the primaries, the upper tail coverts, uh, details of the eye and the bill. Uh, you know, those are the kind of sketches that I come away uh, from powder mill with. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not necessarily planning to carve those birds. I'm simply recording information from whatever bird comes through the banding lab. And uh, many, many, many times that has become invaluable to me. <clears throat> so one day they call up and they say, we have a bittern. Uh, well, that's big excitement because they don't get bitterns very often. They, their nets are set up to uh, concentrate on small passerines. So a, a bittern is uh, unusual to say the least. And I... I got over there as quick as I could, and and here is the very bittern, um, and I uh, made some sketches, uh, but but mostly I just looked at the bird. Uh, but these are a few sketches that I made, uh, concentrated on uh, on the eye because on a bittern, an eye is a is a big part of the look of that bird. Here's the distance between the eye, between the eyes and the eye size itself, and then a few. And I actually made a color note since I had the, the bird, a live bird in hand uh, and uh, it lost a feather. I made a few notes. I was struck with uh, some of the color shifts between gray and this peachy color, which I had never really seen in a, a bird in the field because uh, the wing was always all folded up. It always seemed so brown and ochre to me. Uh, so that was interesting. But, but the most valuable sketches that I made were these. Uh, when we were done with the bird, uh, we, we took it outside and released it. And most birds uh, leave quite quickly. Uh, the bittern did not, it's a bittern. So characteristically, it froze uh, with its beak pointed up and just didn't move. And then it very, very, very slowly uh, walked away, didn't run, just walked away. And that, that gave me the opportunity to make these sketches, uh, you know, from the bird not being held, which often puts it into sort of artificial poses and, and matting its feathers down on its head or something like that. But, but so this was uh, a sketch that I did at the banding lab, but it was more like a sketch that I would do in the field of a bird where I'm concentrating on the attitude of the bird and the character rather than details. So this was just a, a tremendous uh, uh, bit of excitement for me because I really liked the look 
of the bird. I had seen it up close and now I got to see it in action and it became a bird that I wanted to do. So uh, let's go back to the studio and make a bittern. Uh, now these, these are very out of order slides. Um, this is my studio uh, currently. This is, this is what you see from the road. It, it's supposed to look like a barn. Uh, I used to work in the house, but uh, with the growing family at, at a certain point, uh, working in the house was not uh, ideal. Uh, uh, my shop was a great place for the kids with supervision, but it was a really lousy playground, you know, too many sharp things and all that stuff. So I needed a separate studio. And uh, what this, what my studio started out as was a three car garage. And I took the roof off and put a second floor on and then uh, put a new roof on, uh, all with the idea of turning it into a barn. I, I love old barns. I've got a lot of uh, old German barns around me, um, and they're just they're just beautiful. And that's what I always thought would be an ideal workspace is just one great big room. Uh, and uh, I drew a picture of what I wanted, and my dad, who was a civil engineer, uh, did the math and worked out all the numbers, and and we built it. Uh, this is another before picture, the, the chair up there on the roof. <laughs> this is while I was dreaming about my studio and I cut the back legs of the chair off so that it would sit on the pitch of my roof. And I'd, I'd go up there and just pretend I was in my new studio. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's, uh, that's the before and that's as it is today. Uh, from the street, from the road, <clears throat> you don't see any windows, any glass. It just looks like a barn and you have no idea that anybody's up there working hard. Uh, but I've got all glass out into the view that's behind me. And it essentially acts as a giant blind. You know, nothing, I can get up, uh, I can have turkeys or, you know, some wary birds uh, out in the clearing and, uh, without windows behind me, they don't see my movement. So I can get up and, and look freely without uh, spooking them. And the, the view, be, this is what's behind the studio. It's, it's up against a small stream. Uh, and uh, I've tried to make the stream look as big as I can through, the, through photography here, but it's, it's a pretty small stream uh, and then a clearing out behind it. And this is the view from my deck. I've included a little bit of deck in each of these, uh, you know, spring and fall. It's just, it's a perfect setting. It's just absolutely perfect. Uh, when I worked in the house, if it was a nice day, I felt like I was missing it. And in my studio up on the second floor, I open up all the doors and windows and I'm a part of what's outside and I can work through on a nice day without feeling like I'm missing it. So I, I just, I love the studio. Uh, and this is inside the studio. You know, there's the double doors out the back. You can see the stream out there. Uh, and this is, uh, this is my workspace, one big open room. It's about 24 by 32. Uh, and I have it, uh, it's, this is on one of its cleaner days. It's usually, and this may look like a mess to you and it is, but it gets, way messier. Uh, uh, but I have, I have areas dedicated to different tasks. Uh, this is my drawing table uh, and is also where I work on my clay models. In the foreground, you see a little bit of the, the clay models. Uh, and then uh, what's behind me that you can't see is what I call the shop area. You know, that's where the bandsaw and the belt sander and all the, the shop equipment that I use, but but not all that much. You know, it, it's it's it needs to be there, and it takes up a lot of space. But you you're not. I'm not in the shop part all day every day. You know, that's where you bandsaw out the bird or you make base. But but most of the time, I'm in this area right here, uh, you know, working with the hand tools right at the window. Uh, my this is my heavy carving bench. And uh, that's where the carving may start on a bigger piece, but, but most of my time is sitting in this area. 
And then this well lit area is where I paint. And uh, this little alcove here, I call my torch booth and everything that's kind of nasty, uh, you know, chemicals, uh, stuff uh, that gets stored and used in this, in this, my torch booth. And that's where I use my torch with metalworking. And it's, it's vented and, uh, you know, has an exhaust fan. So all the bad stuff gets used in there and, and gets vented. Uh, up in the rafters, uh, you see a couple canoes, which hints at my main uh, interest outside of carving birds, and that would be canoeing. One of these canoes I, I built, the other one is a, a vintage canoe that I had restored. And uh, if I'm not, uh, if I'm not carving birds, uh, I'd rather be canoeing. So that's the studio space. And when I get serious about doing a bird, uh, I make a trip to Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh. Uh, Powder Mill, the banding station, is their field station. Uh, but uh, the museum in Pittsburgh uh, has a section of birds and a magnificent study skin collection. And uh, I borrow study skins uh, from them. And here are three study skins, Bohemian Waxwing in the front, and the bittern, and then a barn owl. I, I've done the Bohemian wax wings. I think that was my world-class piece. Um, I don't know what year. Uh, and the bittern is what I'm working on in this presentation. The barn owl, uh, I haven't done, and I don't know that I ever will. I, I, I had the hots to do a barn owl at one point, but it didn't, it hasn't uh, gone any further than, than the idea. Uh, but those are study skins. Uh, they are not to be confused with taxidermy mounts. Now, there's no attempt for these to be in lifelike positions. They lay flat on their back in drawers. They have cotton in for eyes. There's no, there's no lifelike uh, posture in them. Uh, they are simply the preserved plumage of the bird. And, and that's what the scientific community uh, uses. And I like that as well. Um, I don't want to be duplicating any mistake that a taxidermist might have made. I, I want to trust in my own understanding of the bird's anatomy to put the bird in a lifelike pose. Uh, so uh, here is another shot of, of the, the bittern study skin. And, you know, while you don't get life out of that, that's what my sketch from the bird in the field gives me. And then what I'm after from the study skin is the details that I need uh, to flesh that out into a realistic carving. Uh, the study skin is useful for, for measurements of things that will not change uh, even after it's 100 years old. So here I'm using a pair of dividers and making some uh, some measured drawings of the bill from the study skin. And, and it's useful for that sort of thing, measurements of bill and legs and feet, uh, but, but the, the body is gone. So uh, that I have to come up with uh, on my own. What the study skin is great for is simply having the plumage of that bird. Because as I handle this skin and, and study it, uh, I start to see things that get me excited about the bird carving. Um, you know, I start seeing uh, the way the feathers lay on each other. I, I get a sense of the nature of the feathers, the, the quality of them, whether they have a lot of splits or whether they're, they have tight edges. Uh, you know, I just, as I pour over these study skins, I start to imagine, I start to picture what I would carve and what I would want to play up and what I, I uh, think, well, that isn't gonna work uh, or how am I gonna solve this, this aspect of the feathers? And uh, that study skin uh, just gets me dreaming about the piece that I'm gonna do. You know, nothing beats, uh, the bird in hand, and you can't handle a bittern uh, very often. And so the study skin becomes the, the plumage of the bird 
uh, in a form that I can really have a bird in the hand. Now, I was very fortunate in this instance. I, I do have a, a neighbor up the road who is a taxidermist, and uh, he was doing work for the Pennsylvania Game Commission, and they had a, a dead veteran that they wanted him to, to mount for educational purposes. And uh, he knew I was working on a bittern or thinking about it. And um, he allowed me to uh, babysit the bird the day that it thawed out. You know, it was a frozen bird and it had, to, it had to thaw. It had to just sit out and he couldn't do anything with it while it was thawing. So I got to spend uh, a good bit of time with it as it thawed out. So here was, uh, you know, it's just as dead as the study skin but the bird is intact, the body is still in there. So uh, it has a lot of information that I couldn't get from a study skin. So while I had this bird, I made, uh, you can see the drawings uh, underneath the bird, you know, measuring things, taking, taking notes and that sort of thing. And one of the things that I could do since this was a live bird, well, not live, it was dead, but, but it was, it was, uh, as it was thawing out, I could manipulate the feet a bit. I can't manipulate anything on the study skin, uh, but I was able to sort of put the feet into lifelike poses. And uh, I made uh, drawings of the feet and I decided, well, shoot, why not? And I made a, this is a metal uh, study foot that I made from the, the thawed out bird, just welded it up. Uh, with steel and, and brass uh, and got uh, the character of the foot while I had a model in front of me that I could manipulate. And that ended up being very, very useful in the end. Uh, so then I go to armed with uh, my field experience with the bird, the, the sketches that I've made in the field and with the bird in hand, uh, and then uh, an opportunity to to work with the dead bird uh, and the study skins, all of that comes together and, and out of all of those resources, uh, I work the piece up in clay. Uh, and so this is a life-size clay model. I'm a huge believer in, in the advantage of making a full-size clay model. I do it with every single bird I do, even if it's a, a chickadee, I always make a, a clay model because you can make changes in clay that you cannot make in wood. And I just feel like I have total freedom to really create the, the pose of the bird and the, and the, the, the piece of sculpture uh, working in clay rather than in wood. So I make a clay model and uh, continue working on it until I am pleased with it. And I will not start in wood until I have solved my issues in clay because I've learned that if I can't figure it out in clay where I can add and subtract material, then I'm kidding myself to think that I'll be able to figure it out in wood where I can only subtract, I can't add. So that's my clay model. Uh, and here I'm showing it side by side with those those small sketches that I made of the live bird. And you can see that I'm relying on those sketches uh, primarily. There are a zillion good photos of bitterns on the internet, uh, but the ones that were most valuable to me were the character sketches that I made from a live bird, my own self. So uh, this is a pretty typical situation for me working. Uh, I've got my sketches surrounding me. They're down here on the floor. They're, they're up on a little music stand. I've got my clay model there. Uh, I've got my bird that I'm roughing out. And uh, this, is, this is a pretty typical situation. This is how I look sort of day in and day out. Uh, the only thing that's, that's maybe different is right here, it's very well lit. Uh, for the sake of photography, uh, this is a bit more accurate. I, I actually prefer working in the dark um, with one 
light source because I really rely on uh, the strong shadows that I get from a single light source at a low grazing angle to give me shadows that helps me read the surface of the bird. Uh, in the foreground, you see chisels. I am a, a chisel carver rather than a power carver. I use power tools. You know, I have an NSK. I use it all the time, but it's it's primarily for uh, you know texturing. I, I my preference is to use chisels uh, for the vast majority of the of the carving. Uh, so in this in this picture, I'm using uh, late afternoon light when the light comes in real strong and and hits what's ever in my lap. Uh, but normally this uh, adjustable arm light would be on and I'm constantly shifting it around so that I can better see my surface. I cannot carve uh, outside where I have full sunlight because I just don't get uh, it's too diffused and I don't like working under fluorescent light for carving. I have fluorescent light in the rest of my shop but right where I carve I rely on these incandescent uh, adjustable arm lights that, that give me uh, strong shadows. Uh, the only thing that would make this even better would be if I had three feet of snow outside. That's absolutely perfect carving conditions. Uh, a dark room, uh, all my chisel sharp, uh, and three feet of snow eliminating all distractions. Uh, so that's, that's ideal carving conditions for me. And here is, uh, here, this is, I'm not, I wish I had a better picture to show this, uh, but like I said, I was uh, just using what pictures I had of this piece. But this does give you a little bit of sense of the strong lighting that I prefer when I'm carving. I'm in a dark room and I have one single light source and that gives me these strong shadows that helps me tell how much one feather group is puffed up against its neighboring group how much one feather is raised. Um, I need to be able to read that surface and I prefer uh, a low light situation with one strong light source. And that's pretty much, that's not that far away from being ready to texture for me. You know, uh, this area up here is not, but, but what you see in through here is, is almost ready to texture. Now we're, we're really storming along here because now our bird is all carved, you know, all in uh, two slides. Uh, but, uh, but this bird is now ready to texture. That's the clay model behind it. And the clay model is right there next to me until the point where uh, I go past it. And then the clay model uh, moves out of the picture. And a lot of times I'll move past it relatively early in the game. You know, it, the clay model's purpose is to give me a sense of how to rough the bird out, what shape I want. But the feather detail, uh, that I end up doing in wood. And I don't really do feather detail in the, in the clay model. So uh, we've got two, two methods of texturing. Uh, one is burning and one is grinding. I use them both, but I don't really uh, use both at the same time, uh, ever. I, I tend to do one or the other. Uh, so this is the bittern, and this area is entirely burned. I burn feathers when they have distinct edges and when the shaft shows. Uh, and these, these, uh, this is the scapulars and the wing area. Uh, and these feathers have uh, distinct edges and uh, apparent shafts. And so uh, those are feathers that I would tend to burn. If there is no shaft showing and the feathers are more like hair than feathers, like on the under parts of a bird, then I will tend to grind those. But I tend to do one or the other. I, I don't mix the two. Um, and this is, this is Tupelo and it's, it's well lit here, but this is dark. I, I burn heavy. Uh, I, I burn real heavy. Uh, it's, it's not a light golden brown. I, I tell people my marshmallows are burnt. You know, they're, they're black. They catch fire. They're, they're burnt. Uh, and I, I use a, 
uh, a relatively blunt uh, wood burner. And I do a lot of my, uh, my feather edges with the burner. Uh, there really isn't any carving, uh, def like, like these four feathers right here, one, two, three, four. There was no carved edge to those feathers, but through the burning, you now see four distinct feathers. And I can pick up on that when I'm painting uh, and make it as hard edged as I want through paint, but I can also keep it very soft. I, I like my feather edges to be very, very, very subtle. And then I can play them up with paint. Uh, but you, you can, if you carve it hard edged, then you can paint it hard edged. But if you've carved it hard edged, you can't paint it soft. Uh, I, I need it to be soft carved. And then I can make it hard edged with paint or I can keep it soft edged. Uh, so here on the on the right, we see what is a more accurate uh, sense of how dark I burn. This is this is Tupelo, uh, by the way. And and now I've gotten I've worked all my my way up to where I'm going to start grinding, uh, because the soft neck, those lacy feathers that you saw in the study skin, I look at that and I think, okay, that that needs to be ground. Uh, so this area, the neck of the bird, is prepared for grinding at this point, and there are no edges. There's nothing that you can catch a fingernail on. It's, it's an undulated surface that conforms to feather groups, but there really are no feather edges there. And then I, I grind. Now you are seeing a little bit of burning in amongst the grinding. And that is because in this instance, the soft, loose, hair-like feathers of the bittern are so big that they do have their shafts showing. So I ended up having to uh, do some burning uh, just to establish the shafts. The burning is so much more precise than the grind. I can't grind a shaft in um, as easily as I can burn it. So you, you see a little mix of the two here, uh, but typically, uh, it would be like like this section right here, where there's no burning at all. It's it's either burned or ground. Now this area up here at the top that hasn't been textured yet, uh, it's it's just smooth, and I have gridded it off. Uh, I haven't really drawn feathers. I've just established a grid that tells me where those feathers should be, because again, I'm trying to avoid hard edges. So those, those little diamonds there aid me in placing a feather. Uh, and now you see that area here having been textured. And if, if we go back, uh, notice that, that this is smooth. There's no individual feather shapes established with, with chisels or, or anything. It's simply pencil lines and then I go through what I call an aggressive grind, where I'm not just skating on the top surface. I'm actually digging in and establishing uh, ledges and layers of feather as I go. Uh, it's a bit- Excuse spooky. me, Larry. What yeah. are you using as a bit there? Uh, I don't have a picture of it. it a small- stone cylinder probably a green stone but that doesn't really tell you much my, my favorite uh stone is a shofu dura green stone that's shofu is the manufacturer dura green is is the name that they give to the green stone you know if you go to if you go to the show every Booth selling stones has green stones. Some of them cut aggressively and tear the wood. Some of them uh, cut less aggressively and don't tear the wood. You know, you've got to sort of feel your way through it. But I found that the Shofu Dura Green stones uh, cut 
aggressively, but they don't tear the wood up. I, I really like them. So it's it's either the 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 little green cylinder or the white stones. I think Shofu calls them Dura White and Dura Green. Uh, and I just I've always liked them. Doesn't mean that that's the only one that I would use. I, I use uh, whatever I pick up a lot of times. Uh, but but the the Dura Greens I like this is Tupelo, so it's far more forgiving. If I was grinding in basswood, I would definitely want to be using the Dura greens. Um, um, so, I uh, they they just they cut soft. I don't know how. That's the best way I have to describe it. They just cut soft, and I'm I always try and and grind with the grain if at all possible. And I start at the tail end of the bird and move forward. So I'm always grinding a feather out onto one that I've already ground. I find that that gives me a much better edge. You know, you see that all kinds of places, like down here where I'm grinding out onto a, a feather that's already textured. Now up here where I kind of have this neck group and then the cheek group, uh, where, where I have two groups meeting, you know, I've gone in there and ground quite heavily and, and taken a good bit of material out. I suppose I could have done that with, with chisels, and there's times when I would, but uh, when I do one of these sort of aggressive grinds, I, I, just, I just grind heavy, and I end up sort of lowering the whole surface, uh, and I can play with, with that and create subtle levels and establish individual feathers just in the texturing process. Now out here on the crest, I have actually carved, you know, edges uh, because the bird does have a bit of a crest, but, uh, but the individual feather distinction you see in this whole picture, uh, if, if, again, if we go back, uh, there is no feather edges there. Uh, it's just all pencil layout of feather edges. And it is in the texturing rather in the carving that I establish my, my feather edges. And again, normally I'm not mixing the burning and the grinding to this degree. What you see in this little area in his back is more typical where, where this feather right here, uh, there's the shaft. And I, I burned one side and ground the other side. And this one right here, it's the same thing. Half of it is burned, half of it is ground. And then here we have two, two burned feathers and then I stop burning and I ground the next one. There is no transition. I just go from burning to grinding and my heavier uh, burning point uh, is leaving the same mark behind as the corner of that little cylinder and that gives me the freedom to move freely between the two uh, without having to worry about transitions. I think I have, well, okay. Uh, another thing that I'll mention is uh, as I work my way up the head, usually when I get to about the eye of the bird, uh, I go back to the burning because the detail and the radiuses are just too tight uh, for the grinding, I want the precision that I can get with the burning. So a lot of my birds, uh, wings and tail are burned, then the body is ground, and then as I get up to the eye, I, I go back to, to burning again. Okay, this is, this is a more typical bird for me. This is a yellow rumped warbler that uh, uh, I had on goldenrod that won world championship uh, well, I don't remember what year, but but here is a, a much more typical situation than the bittern. I've burned the tail, I've burned the wings, where where the feathers have distinct hard edges and and prominent shafts. Then I burn, and then the body I ground, and then when I got to the eye and I didn't feel like I could control it as precisely as I wanted with the grinding, then I went back to the burning. Uh, but there really is no um, 
no transition between the two. It's just starkly one or the other. And then when I paint that, uh, you can't tell. You know, you just you just can't tell which area I burned and which area I ground. Uh, and that's that's because my burning and my grinding are leaving the same mark behind. Uh, and here's here's one more example. Uh, in the center, this is the bittern again, and and right in the center, we have uh, this this area where you have two groups of feathers that are overlapping kind of coarsely. You know, a lot of splits, and a, you you see a, a thatch of feathers building up right in here. Now that's done uh, with burning, and here's the same exact sort of effect done with grinding. Now, this is not the bittern. This is a bird, a, a piece that I did years ago. Uh, but, but again, it's the exact same effect. Uh, here it is burned, you know, a crisscrossing thatch of feathers. And here's the same thing, ground. And in this picture, it's all grinding. There isn't a speck of burning there. And in this picture, it's all burning. There isn't a speck of grinding there. And it, what it comes down to is looking at the plumage of the bird and thinking ahead to painting and deciding if I want to paint over a burned surface or a ground surface. Uh, also noteworthy is, is the area that is not ground here, uh, because again, you see that it's absolutely smooth. There's no feather carving. There's some pencil indication of feather shapes. Uh, now, in the area that's been textured, you see all kinds of feather shapes, and those have been established with the texturing rather than with carving techniques. Larry, I'm going to jump in real quick to just say it's a little more than 10 minutes left in the hour. Um, okay. And we've got some questions in the in the chat. I don't know if you want to address those now or if okay. you want to. Uh, okay. Well, uh, if, if we got a little. I better speed it up here <laughs> if, if we're dealing with 10 more minutes. So let me get through it. Hopefully okay. I'll answer questions as we go and, uh, and then we'll deal with questions with what time is left. So okay. this is uh, just a, a bigger view of that piece. It was a Jaeger. Uh, and in this instance, the grinding never let me down and I didn't start burning past the eye. I just ground it all the way to the end. But the point is I either burn or grind. Uh, I don't mix both. Uh, now, if I have ground, this is back to the bittern, uh, uh, my ground areas, I give them a coat of death. The, the burned areas, they're already sealed. The, the degree to which I burn seals them. Uh, and then once it's painted white, uh, you can no longer see, uh, you can no longer tell uh, where burning stopped and where grinding started. And, and this is the kind of surface that I like to paint over. It, the surface uh, is feathery, but it doesn't commit to, to anything. You know, this, the edge of this feather is so subtle. You know, I can, I can do whatever I want with that, with paint, um, because there's no edge to trap me into to anything. I can end up painting, you know, right there, it looks like two feathers. I can paint three feathers there. I, I can do whatever I want because my surface is so subtle. Uh, there's the area uh, that we talked about on the neck, all, all textured and ready to paint. And again, whatever individual definition that you see there was done in the texturing process, not in carving. It's around the eye. And that's the that's the wing. Now that whole area, that's all burning rather than grinding. And that's a combination of the two. And and this this area right here, that's what I really want to paint over. It's a very feathery, lacy thatch, but I've I'm free to paint edges where I want them and as hard as I want them. So there's a bird ready to paint. Uh, and the painting begins. The first step for me in painting is to work out my strategy and my colors on test sheets. When I'm priming the bird with gesso, I'm also priming some pieces of cardboard. And uh, I work out 
my colors and my painting strategy and get warmed up on paper rather than on my bird. This takes all the fear out of uh, screwing your bird up out of the equation. And, uh, and it's just, it's a, it's a very important part of the process for me. I, you know, I use these sheets, here's a second page on this bird to, to get my, my colors, to mix up my colors. And, and then I store them and paint out of my, I used to work out of uh, film cans, but I've switched over to using syringes, no needles, just the, just the syringe itself. And I, after I've mixed up the colors that I need, I just fill the syringe and squirt out a bit more onto my palette. My palette is a washing machine lid. I've been using the same washing machine lid for 45 years. Uh, it's great. It's white. It's enamel. I, it's the same white that my gessoed bird is. My colors look true to me on it. Uh, I use Liquitex acrylics primarily. Uh, I like them in jars rather than tubes. I think that the tubes are shinier. Got my test sheets next to me. My, my water container, see that little glint of, of light there? That's, that's huge. Uh, my water container has to have those ridges in it which comes out of sherbet containers. At, because I'll when I need a little bit of water, I'll dip into that little ridge uh, to get a little bit of water. I don't like dipping into the whole thing. I end up getting more water than I want. Um, stiff bristle brush for gesso, uh, soft wash brush. My favorite brush is a, a number four Raphael. Uh, I use pencils to lay out the pattern. Uh, and that there is the best uh, eraser the world has ever seen, a, a Statler Mars plastic eraser. It's just, um, it's not abrasive. It takes the lead off, but it's not abrasive. Uh, I start painting at the tail end of the bird. I'm more comfortable with the hard edged feathers and work my way forward. Uh, and as I go, each each next area tells you what you still need to do in the previous area. Uh, in this instance, the shadows that you see there are um, painted in shadows rather than lighting. I do some, some wet on wet underpainting uh, and just work my way up the bird. Here you see my painting sheet and my palette and my my syringe with bittern brown in it. And, uh, and I just, I proceed slowly. Uh, I don't like to overcommit. I wanna creep up on it. And so here I'm establishing the a pale version of the neck streaks. And if I like what I see, then I keep going. If I don't like what I see, it's a whole lot easier to uh, change it, modify it if it's pale. Uh, and there is, uh, Getting close to being the finished bird. It's not, the piece isn't done yet. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that happens is every time you do an area, if we go back to this area, uh, you know, I've got the head on there now and, and you see that the back is the same sort of rusty color as you see in the picture on the left. And once I got the neck going, then I decided that the back needed a little more enhancement. And I went back and uh, put another layer of, of detail onto the back. And it's very hard to do that without having the, the next area done. Uh, so I do, I work from the tail forward, but then I go back a lot too. You know, once I get the, the back done, now this wing is looking a bit pale to me and it's gonna to need to be punched up as well, that sort of thing. There it is head on. Uh, <clears throat> so now I have enhanced the wing and that's, uh, that's pretty much uh, painted. Uh, painting and making feet go together in my mind. It's hard to paint all day. Uh, you you burn out, you run the risk of making mistakes late in the day, but the day still has lots of hours in it, and that's that tends to be when I make feet. Uh, so here's here's what I'm using uh, when I'm making feet. 
up in the upper left, we have the study skin feet. And then that's the, the study steel foot that I made from the, the dead but intact bird. And then over here, these are black crown night heron feet, not the same as bittern feet, but similar enough to where the chance to handle a live bittern being banded, or night heron being banded, gave me a lot of insight into how uh, to make the feet. So with all that information, I torch up the feet. My, my feet tend to be steel with, uh, I use brazing rod to form and file claws. And then I, I braze them onto the end of steel toes. Uh, and then over top of that armature goes epoxy. In this case, um, I, I love the green epoxy. It, it's, it's got a stiffness and body that just lends itself to feet. The trick is that you can't do too much at once. Uh, you have to break it down into manageable units. And in the case of this bittern, I was breaking it down into very small manageable units. Usually a manageable unit is one toe at a time. But in this case, I was mixing up epoxy and just doing the scales on the top of the toe. And that was it. That's all you could, could handle. And then after that cured, then I'd mix up more and do the pads underneath the toe. And, you know, it, it just, every painting day, at the end of the day, uh, you, you make another toe. Uh, and, and after the toes are all epoxied, I paint them white and then paint them their colors. And then you step back and you look at the bird, you know, it's done, but I'm always looking at it and trying to decide if it is really done. If there's anything that bothers me, if there's any part of it that's lagging behind. And in this case, uh, I decided that uh, the area between the black mark on the throat and the streaks on the neck, I, in my effort to creep up on those two things, I never got all the way there. So I looked at this and decided there's a vague sort of no man's land in between the, the two. You know, I've got the black streak and then not, and I've got the, the brown streaks and then not. And I decided that I wanted that transition to be less stark. Uh, so this was my enhancement to that. I, I boldened the black streak and drew it down the neck further. And now you don't see that funny little gap in between the two. The black streak goes right into the, the brown streaks. And at that point, I declared the, the piece uh, finished and once finished, uh, then I put uh, the matte medium, gloss medium on the bill and feet. Uh, and that is the finished piece. Pretty phenomenal. Um, now I have a few extra minutes to stick around if, if you do as well, Larry. Um, are you able to, to answer a few I, questions? I can stick around as long as uh, the questions keep coming. Okay, um, we've got, plan on maybe another 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. So I'm gonna go back a little bit um, and we'll, I'm just gonna go through some of these questions here. And somebody asked if this PowerPoint would be made available. We have recorded this, so we will post it on um, the website. Uh, on, on the Word Museum's website, wordmuseum.org. So we definitely can come back and check out more in detail. Um, all right, early on when you were talking about measurements, uh, somebody asked, what's the best way to determine where the shoulder starts? Shoulder, hmm. I'm not sure what they mean by shoulder. And I don't, maybe I should get out of uh, screen sharing here or, or maybe, uh, I. <clears throat> let's see, the, that's a, that's a tough one. The, the problem with birds is that all the things that you need to know about anatomy are covered up. You know, the, the feathers cover everything. And, and my big thing with, with avian anatomy is to always consider the point of origin, uh, which you can never see. Uh, and the shoulder is one of those things. Uh, you can see the wrist, but you can't really see the shoulder. It's completely covered up with feathers. Uh, I, if that person is still here and 
can give me a more specific sense of what they mean by shoulder. Do they mean where the, uh, the humerus leaves the body? Uh, Robin, yeah. If Robin wants to unmute themselves, we can do that. I'm trying to find, see if Robin is still here. Yes, hi, how you doing? Hi. So I guess what I'm talking about, maybe the shoulder wasn't the correct part that I was asking about, but the top of the wing in relationship with- Is that the, where I'm, I've got the cursor right now? Uh, let me pull this off. Yes, exactly. Okay, that's the wrist. Okay, the wrist then. Yeah, yeah. And uh, let's see, I, I do wanna get out of this. How, let me uh, go back to the beginning here. Give it a, a little moment to catch up. But I'm gonna take you back to my, uh, my sketches. Um, and, and, and that I'm getting from, from the live bird. You know, I'm, I'm looking at the bird and, and sketching it. And then when I, uh, when I got to my clay model, You know, I'm, I'm looking at that clay model and, uh, and trusting my, my observations in my field sketch and, uh, and, and trying to duplicate uh, what I saw. But, but the, the area that you're talking about, that wrist, that asking where those wrists are is, is akin to asking you know, how far are your hands apart? You know, changes all the time. Okay, uh, so it's constant, it's moving, so. Right, yeah. right. You know, it depends on whether you want that bird with the wrists out and exposed or, or in and overlapped. Um, you know, how far are your feet apart? Changes depending on your position. You, your hips are always the same distance apart, but your knees are not and your feet are not. Uh, mm -hmm. and those wrists, it's the same sort of thing. It depends on the pose that I've chose to put the bird in. All right, thank you. Thanks. Sure. I have another question that asks, um, do you take photographs along with the sketches? Do you use photographs ever? No, uh, well, very rarely because photography is, uh, good photography is a skill that, I, I haven't necessarily cultivated in myself. Uh, I'd rather sketch. I, I'd rather sketch than photograph uh, because I believe that sketching makes me a better observer than mm -hmm. photography. Uh, because if I have a camera, uh, my tendency is to take the shot and tell myself, uh, I could, there, I got the shot. I can study it later. I've got the shot. And, and if I'm sketching, I can't do that. I, I can't say, I've got the shot. I'll study it later. I have, to, I have to study it right when what I'm studying is in front of me. And that's a better time to make those observations than, than pouring over your photography later. So I just, I find that I, I can get what I want easier with, with sketching than I can through photography. You know, I use a lot of, I'll look at any, photo, any photograph that I can get my hands on. I use photography, but I, I would rather sketch than photograph. And uh, this shot that you see right here, uh, I'm surrounded by my sketches. I'm not surrounded by photos. Um, you know, I. I, I like to work from my sketches. So I definitely rely on photography, but if I have that study skin, uh, that takes the place of photography for me. The study skin uh, gives me the details and my sketches give, give me overall confirmation. And that's, that's what I prefer to work from. Hmm. Interesting, thank you. That's funny, in this photo, I always assumed that that was a setup because I know that that was a professional photographer visiting you that day. I thought yeah. that they put that around, but that's how you work. That's, that's how I work, yep. yep. <laughs> Okay, I have a couple of questions. Uh, a couple of people asked the same question, um, which is what type of clay do you use to create your models? 
uh, originally, uh, let's, let's, uh, in the early days, uh, I used the only clay that was really available to me, which was plasticine. Uh, and and uh, see, here's the clay model for my snowy owl that's at the museum. And that's plasticine. Uh, it never gets hard. If that thing falls over, it mushes its whole face in. Uh, the, the white clay and the pink clay are all uh, sculpy. Uh, the white is sculpy, the pink is super sculpy. Uh, both have different characteristics. The, the white is cheaper uh, and is softer. So when I'm forming up a bird, I, I like it to be the white stuff, but then when I'm tooling out some detail, I, I want it to be the pink stuff again. But it's a, it, it is a, a polymer clay rather than an earth clay. So what that means is you're not firing it in a ceramic kiln at high temperatures. Uh, you can fire this stuff at 275 degrees in your kitchen oven, um, and and uh, and that's what that's and it doesn't shrink any, which is critical to me. If I've made it accurate and and exactly how I want it, then I don't want it to shrink. Uh, so bigger birds like the snowy owl, and here's a, a loon that I did in clay and haven't ever carved, but but the bigger birds, I tend I tend to still use the plasticine, uh, just because of economy, uh, but the, the, the models for the smaller things tend to be uh, polymer clay, which I've, I've fired uh, once I got it how I wanted it, and now it's, it's durable enough to be a working model for me in, in the carving process. Thank you. Um, and then someone asks, uh, with the study skins, are the feather colors in a study skin true? I would say yes. The the study skins um, tend to be in a light proof, bug proof case at the museum, and they've been there for. I, I've had skins that were a hundred years old, um, or more, and and the colors the colors are true for the feathers. Uh, now sometimes you get a skin that was dark, or or light. Well. Uh, if it sat out uh, somewhere in the daylight, it can fade. But if it's been in a case, uh, whatever darkness or lightness is generally what the bird had when it was alive. You know, the Carnegie Museum is in Pittsburgh, and, and you can tell, you know, Pittsburgh uh, historically in the steel days uh, was a dirty town, and the study skins from that era are darker. Uh, and it's simply dirt, uh, but they haven't darkened with age. That's just what they always were. So I, I do trust the colors in a study skin. Uh, they're variable. When I go down and pick out my skins, I'm, I'm picking the ones that have the color that I want, the pattern that I want. With the bittern, they were quite variable. Uh, some of them were more barred. Some of them were tiger striped. You know, it, uh, there, there's a lot of variability there. And, and it is worth pointing out that at a certain point, I put the study skin away. I don't, I, I use it to get me going in the painting, uh, but no one is ever going to compare my carving to the study skin that I used. Uh, they will never be seen together ever. Uh, and at a certain point, there is no point to trying to match that skin. I use it to get the ball rolling, uh, but uh, it eventually leaves the painting table and, and I concentrate on making my carving look as good as I can make it. And if I deviate from the skin, so be it. I'm happy to do that because there's no, there's no advantage to matching a skin that no one will ever see. But there is an advantage to making the object that I've carved look as good as I can make it. So at a certain point, I quit trying to match color and try and, and paint in a way that enhances the shape of of my, my sculpted bird. Thank you. Um, there's an, another question about um, painting over burning and, and if, uh, um, what would you say, catching your marshmallows on fire or some such, <laughs> um, burning your marshmallows. Yeah. 
uh, if you were going to be uh, making a white colored bird, would you burn as heavily as you did on this? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would. It, it's gone all different ways. I, that snowy owl that's in the museum, uh, it's, its wings are, are burned just like this bitter and dark and it's, its belly and head were all ground. Uh, and I spent uh, probably an entire day uh, gessoing that bird to even out the, the two. Uh, that's why I had, uh, if you remember, I had a bristle brush on my palette, which I mentioned was for gessoing. And that's because I, I don't want to clog up my texture and my detail uh, with gesso. And sometimes I'm putting six, eight, 10 coats of gesso on a burned area to get it white. Uh, a ground area turns white with the first coat of gesso, but the burned areas don't. And I end up, uh, uh, but yes, uh, my, my burned ground birds are very uneven. And I insist that they get even uh, in white before I start painting them. And it, it goes both ways. The snowy owl, I had to get him white. Uh, I did a pileated woodpecker. He was all burned. He was dark. And I gessoed him and got him pure white and then painted him dark. Uh, but I needed to because I didn't have any control over my darks if I painted over the burned areas. And uh, I'm building up my blacks with, with a lot of coats. It, it's not pure black. You have high lit areas that are actually quite gray. And uh, that's why I like to start with a pure gessoed bird. Uh, Thank you. Um, okay, and somebody asks, I'm, I'm not quite sure what this means, but um, hopefully you do or, or they can unmute themselves to ask if, if you're not sure. Um, how do you avoid getting fuzzies when you're grinding? Well, I could talk about that a long time. Um, I think I think a primary reason is that I'm a chisel carver instead of a power carver. I, I think I think when you when you rough out your bird with power and a cuts all bit, you have distressed the fibers of the wood down deep. And you can clean off the top surface and get down to clean wood. Uh, but I think you've rattled the fibers down deep. Uh, I know that, that fuzz is a big problem for people all the time. And I simply haven't experienced that much of a problem with it. And I think it's because I'm using sharp edges and I've never distressed the wood fibers down deep. I simply don't get the fibers raising up. I always try and grind with the grain rather than across. And most of the time you can do that, but there's times when you simply can't and, and then things can get a little fuzzy. Uh, but I, I understand the problem, but I can honestly tell you that that I don't think I have encountered it as much as uh, power carvers do. And I, I believe without any real proof or documentation, I believe that, that uh, carving my birds with sharp edges, chisels and knives uh, bypasses a lot of the fuzz issues uh, that, that are set up without you even knowing it when you're roughing out a bird with a coarse cuts all bit uh, and just rattling that wood uh, down deeper than the surface. Okay. I have a little, well, I, I also have a little nylon brush that, uh, that I picked up on the clearance rack of some art store. I have no idea who made it. I've used that same brush for 40 years now, and it's the best brush I've ever found for hitting ground areas and taking fuzz away without screwing up the texture that you want. Uh, so it's a combination of a number of little idiosyncrasies and, and tools that I have, but uh, it, it, fuzz has not been a big issue for me. So I may not be the right one to answer that question. <laughs> okay. Uh, somebody also asked if you ever use ceramic rods for grinding. I've, I've tried them. They don't I think of them as being 
too strident, if if that makes any sense. They they I think they tear things up more than I want to. That's why I like those uh, those dur green stones because they cut soft, and the ceramic stones or the wait we're talking. Give me that question again. Mr. Do you ever use ceramic rods for grinding? Ceramic rods. I don't know that I have a ceramic rod. I have some little fiberglass rods. Uh, and that's what I'm talking about when I say they're, they're, too, they're too strident. They, they are too sharp. They, they're, they're aggressive, but they do more tearing up than, than removal. I, I'm not sure what, what they mean by ceramic rods. I'd be happy to have uh the little ceramic cylinder that i have on the end of a steel shaft if that came in a rod form you know a 330 seconds rod form that i could just chuck into my my nsk i would definitely use that but the rods that i've seen haven't been the same kind of ceramic they've been uh they're too hard they're too sharp and and i i have some i i thought that they were sort of fiberglass i don't use them much Okay. They tear things up. Um, somebody asked to use gesso, which you, you did say. Is there anything else that you seal your bird with? Uh, the, the, the one coat of deft on ground areas. And then um, I'm very particular about my gesso. Uh, it has to be Liquitex gesso. Uh, I remember Bob Googie and I were were painting side by side in some situation and, and he didn't have gesso. Uh, I said, here, use some of mine. And he had been using Grumbacher gesso and he, he used my Liquitex gesso and he said, whoa. And, and this was a, a perfect Googie-ism. He, he said, uh, this does absolutely everything that I wanted to do and doesn't do any of the things that I don't want it to do. Um, and and we did a gesso comparison, and and the Liquitex gesso just outperformed everything. It it has it has just the right tooth. Tooth is the ability of a, a ground of a of a primer of a gesso to hold uh, what goes over top of it. You know, a a raw plaster wall has nothing but tooth. Uh, a piece of glass has no tooth. Uh, Liquitex gesso has just the right tooth. It holds the paint, but it doesn't hold it too much. If you put a wash on Grumbacher gesso, in my experience, uh, when you first put your brush down, uh, as you start to move it around and spread that wash, there may be the slightest little hint of a halo from that initial contact. That's too much tooth. It grabbed it right away. And the Liquitex gesso doesn't do that. Uh, it's the only gesso I've ever used uh, other than uh, some experiments. And it's the only one that I will because it has just the right amount of tooth. Do you use anything to finish this, uh, to seal the finished bird? Nothing. I, I've never found anything that is as flat as the paint, the way I've put it on. You know, dull coat, any, any finish, which you might have to get into if you're doing birds that are going in the water, but my birds are not. Um, you know, it, it's uh, usually the luster that my birds have on the surface is, is right what I want, uh, right when I've gotten all the paint that I want on the bird. Um, you know, the, acrylic paint is plastic, and if you build it up too thick, uh, it gets plasticky and shiny, and that's not a good thing. Uh, a little bit of luster is a good thing. A healthy, well preened bird has a little bit of luster to it. I think the Joe Sonia paints straight out uh, without anything else are too flat. You know, everybody's trying to avoid shine, so they do use Joe Sonia, but it goes too far the other way. It flattens your bird out. You can't. You can't see things that are carved there because it's so flat that it's flattened little mounds and, and individual feathers. So I find that Liquitex paint in the jars, which are less shiny, uh, as I slowly build up washes, uh, right when they're getting to the point where uh, 
anymore and it's going to get shiny and I'm not going to like it. Uh, but usually there's a sweet spot where I've got the paint that I need to get on the bird and it's starting to pick up a little tiny bit of shine. I wouldn't call it shine, I'd call it luster. And that's a good thing. I, I think that's that indicates a healthy, happy bird. It's different with different birds. You know, the bittern, I didn't want any of that. A bittern is a very uh, dry bird. Uh, the herons in general are. They don't, they don't preen their feathers with oil like a duck does. They preen with powder down and, and they just are a, an especially dry, non-glossy bird. So I didn't even want a luster on the bittern. I wanted him to be dead, dead flat, so. Like I, and I could go on and on about that one. <laughs> um, a couple people have asked whether you ever use an airbrush. Uh, I use airbrush on habitat. Uh, I've, I've very rarely used it on birds. I've used it uh, on, with gesso. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I use it to try and get a bird that's going to be white uh, at, that I've burned so black dark. Uh, I have used gesso to try and get an even coat of white on a bird but you know even if the even if the gradation on a bill is airbrush smooth i'd rather i'd rather struggle through it with a brush i i think that if you look at a bird well if i look at one of my birds and i can tell that i've used an airbrush then that's a mark against it I, so i uh, no, I don't use the airbrush on the birds. I'd rather do it by hand. It may not be as smooth as the real bird is, but it makes your whole bird hang together. Too often, if you've used an airbrush, that jumps out. And I want my bird to cross the finish line, every part of the bird at the same time. I don't want any part to be ahead or behind. And if if I've used an airbrush here and a paintbrush there, I think that that can set up uh, inconsistencies that keep my bird from finishing all at the same time. But the bird is more visually consistent if I use a brush the whole way. So no, no airbrush on the bird, but I do use it on the habitat uh, at times. Okay. And somebody's wondering, what is green epoxy? Is it something you make or do you buy it? No, it, it uh, used to be available everywhere. It's Duro Epoxy Ribbon. Uh, no longer available in hardware stores, but Jim Hahn uh, still has it. Uh, and, and maybe some other folks. Uh, when, when they quit making it, I'm either going to have to quit making bird feet or, or look for other methods. It's just, it's unbeatable. Uh, hands down, the best uh, epoxy for the fleshy eyelid and and feet in in my book. A lot of people hate it because they find it too difficult to work with. But I've come up with all kinds of tricks along the way to to make it workable, um, and I, I love it. Um, but it it comes in a, a, a ribbon that is blue and yellow, and you cut off as much as you want, mix it together. Uh, one thing that I always tell people is make sure you cut the center section where they meet out because that has little hard bits where it's already cured. Uh, and I always cut the, the center out before I mix it up. Hmm. Right. Um, and then somebody asks, when burning so dark, how are the burden uh, lines so thin and close together? Is that from burning very quickly or the quality of the wood that you're using? They find that burning dark um, creates wide burn lines. Well, I'm, uh, that's another one that I could talk about for a long time. I, I, I'd have to ask them what kind of burner they're using. I find that, that most carvers are using burners that I find unworkable. They're, they're too razor thin. My burner, uh, you know, the bevel that creates the, the burning edge of my burner, it, it's, it's not 90 degrees, but it's, it's fairly, it, it's not a razor at all. Uh, and I find that, that the, the razors, the two thin ones, if, if you burn hot, you end up burning deep. Uh, and, 
and mine don't burn deep, they burn wide. It, it, um, it, you, have to, you have to find that, that happy, you know, and you adjust your temperature. If you're burning on basswood, as opposed to Tupelo, that makes a huge difference. Uh, basswood is much easier to burn than Tupelo. Basswood, I can just skate on the surface and it does what I want. Tupelo, I have to be more aware of the fact that uh, this could go uh, too deep or too wide on me without me intending. I end up having to float the burner across Tupelo more than basswood. But uh, if, if, I, if I have my burner cranked up, it, part of it is, is speed. Um, uh, how much time do we have here? I think we can probably go another five minutes, five minutes or so. Okay, well, I'll, I'll answer this question in a little more depth. We're going into the blooper reel at the <laughs> end, pictures that got called out. Uh, this one. Um, let me get back to uh, make this bigger from current slide. Okay, you got the full screen up there? Yep. See, see right here, this little serrated edge of that feather? That, that little edge there, uh, what happened? Are you still there? Yes, I'm here. It looks like there's the end of the slideshow. Can you go back? Oh, yeah. I clicked on it. I, I clicked on it. Yeah, got it. Okay. I <clears throat> uh, got to use my other. Uh, this little serrated edge, that was a pencil line. And, and using that coarser burner, the act of setting that tip down, that little bit of hesitation as you place your burner, made it burn a, a little heavier right there. And that little bit of hesitation and that hard, you can see that it's darker here and then it's lighter down here. I'm setting the burner down at this edge and then I'm pulling it away relatively quickly. So I'm using a hot, dark burn right when I place the burner down. And then as I pull it out, it's getting lighter because I have moved with more speed. So, uh, that means that this area right up against this feather has been kind of depressed, burned down a little bit lower. And that's what is, has established my feather edge there. I don't, I don't know if that's answering the question or not, but, um, but as I burn, uh, as I burn uh, darker, I'm not, I'm not really going deeper. You know, some of these splits, like that split right there, I'm doing that with the burner. A, a split like this one, I have gone in there with a small V tool because uh, it's open big enough to where I've textured the other way inside of it. But uh, but I I find that the the bulkier, hotter burner gives me all kinds of of ways that I can create feather edges and manipulate uh, the wood that I simply can't with a thin, thin razor burner. No matter how high, high I crank up that thin burner, it still won't enable me to roll a feather edge over because it has no bulk. My, if you remember the burners that we were using in the 70s, you know, when you went up in the attic and got that wood burner out of that, you know, with the long cord and the, and the great big blunt tip uh, that was a quarter inch round. I loved those tips. That's what I'd still be using today if I could find one that I had complete heat control with. I, I mean, those, uh, so my, my fancy new modern wood burner, uh, it's tiny little wire out there at the end I've got that blunt and bold like those wood burners that came out of your attic. I just have the precision and close tolerances and heat control of modern wood burners. Thank you. Um, I think one more question here. And then I just put in the chat also that tomorrow um, 
at noon, we're going to be showing an interview that, that Larry was kind enough to sit for. Um, so we're doing interviews every day at noon this weekend with the different living legends. And Larry Barth is, of course, one of the three 2020 to 2021 living legends. Um, so Larry's will be tomorrow, that Sunday at noon on the Ward Museum's Facebook page, as well as YouTube. And then I think we've twisted his arm to be part of our world champion Zoom panel at one o'clock. Um, and so that that is something that you need to sign up for. You can email me for a link and I'll put my email address in the chat. But we'll leave with this. The last question um, is, how do you approach the composition part of your carvings? And do you have a good sense of form from the beginning or do you work as work it out as you go along? Uh, well, I, I work in two ways. This bittern is is a way that I'm doing more and more of where the composition is the bird itself. And, and there's, there's, no, there's no habitat. Uh, and so in a situation like that, I'm, I may have a gesture in mind, uh, which in this case was inspired by that sketch. Uh, and and that, that appeals to me. And then in clay, I, I flesh that out. Uh, in clay, I get a look at it in 360 degrees. That, that tends to make some changes. Uh, it, 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 comes, uh, it comes through the work in clay. Uh, if, if, you, if you're talking about composition as, as a, uh, an entire piece with a base and habitat, branches, reeds, grass, whatever it is, then, uh, then then that, that's different uh, in that the bird, while being the primary reason for the piece to exist, the bird almost becomes secondary. The composition as a whole is more important to me. And in the little time that we have, I'm not sure I can, I can describe it fully, but, but composition becomes very abstract. Uh, to me, even though my birds are very, very realistic, very not abstract, my compositions, at least in my mind, are abstract. My, my compositions tend to be things like converging lines, uh, you know, uh, lines either coming together or moving apart. It, it becomes a, a balance of, of uh, two objects uh, on a teeter-totter. You know, you just kind of got a, uh, a, a balance point at some point and you have two elements, two separate birds, and uh, one may be big, the other uh, may be smaller, in which case I might have used two smaller birds to balance a bigger bird, uh, but that kind of composition is happening I'm using the birds as compositional elements and trying to work a composition that uh, that works for me in abstract terms. And, and even if it had no surface of tight, beautiful feathers, even if it was just, uh, you know, welded up sheet metal or, or something, it would still be an interesting composition. And then it's my choice to, to incorporate realistic birds into that, that design. Uh, but, and and that's, that's exactly why I'm getting back to doing pieces like this bittern, because I feel myself um, returning to my roots with a piece like this bittern, because it's getting back to the bird itself, because my my more elaborate compositions are becoming more about the design of the whole piece and and the bird is not as prominent as it once was it's an important part uh, but it's just not uh it i think that every part of a composition is is equally important so if there's if there's a rock in the piece that's as important as the bird uh it may not look like it the bird is clearly the subject matter, but every part uh, needs to be equally considered. And, uh, and that occurs in the clay model stage as well. But in a composition like that, the clay model of the bird is just one element. And then I'm taping together 
sticks and twigs and I'm mocking up the whole piece uh, like that that bohemian waxwing uh, that I showed the study skin of uh, those my pair of bohemians were in sumac well I had an acre of sumac in my studio and I was cutting and wiring together and and you know working out the composition whether it's just the bird or the whole piece uh, that occurs in in what I consider the clay model stage and only when I feel like um, I'm all set do I um, do I start in wood so the piece in my mind is finished before I started in wood uh, because I can look at my clay model and I know that I've got it, but then I have to do it over in wood so that other people can see what I was picturing in my head. Thank you, that's phenomenal. Um, I, I gotta, I'm gonna be gone for one instant while I plug my computer in because its battery is low. <laughs> okay, well, Larry's doing that all again, just plug that we'll, we will be showing an interview with Larry Barth uh, tomorrow at noon on the Facebook page and YouTube page for the Ward Museum. Again, you do not need to sign up for that, but you do need to sign up to get the link for the Zoom at one o'clock, which is a world champion panel. I have a number of really great folks on there. Um, so feel free to email me. I put my email in the chat. Looks like Larry is back. I'm back. Um, <laughs> all right. And uh, I want to thank you very much, Larry, for, for taking time out this weekend to talk with us. That was an amazing amount of knowledge and talent that you shared and uh really appreciate it okay. uh, and i can't wait to celebrate you next year in person in ocean city <laughs> yeah this seems really weird sitting at home this weekend <laughs> <laughs> very strange all right and thank you all very much for being a part of this um and we'll see you all next year okay thank you larry okay thanks much thank you thank you larry Thanks, that was great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yep, thank very you awesome. very much. Very awesome, thanks for the information. A lot of folks on there. I think the most at any one time was 60, one, but we had another few that kind of came and went. So that was great. All right, well, I'm gonna sign off and go jump to other for various virtual things that are happening around here. But Larry, will we see you tomorrow, I hope? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right, I'll be yeah. on that. I, do I already have the link for that in the same email where I got the link for you this? You should, but I'll send it to you again right now, just to make sure. Okay. Um. I'm gonna write myself a note because in the two minutes that it takes for me to go from this to my, my other computer, I will forget. <laughs> I bet, I bet. So has this weekend been less hectic or even more hectic than- Hectic in a very five? different way. It's probably overall less hectic because I actually get to go home around five, um, you know, but it's it's chaos in, in one, you know, in one office. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but it's been going well. It's it's going smoothly. We've got. I'm actually looking at my computer screen. You know, live judging that's been happening, and and um, we're uh, blah, blah, blah. what am I trying to say? Showing that on Facebook, and we've had a lot of people watching that. The one this morning reached like twenty thousand people on Facebook. It was amazing. Wow. So you know, the actual views, people who watched for longer than three seconds, I think, is with Facebook sort of cutoff point. It's over seven thousand people for just this morning's judging. So we're reaching more people than we ordinarily would in person. Hmm. Um, it's just a different kind of interaction, but I'm, I'm hoping that that means good things for next year when we get to all come back together. Well, that could mean that you'll have to do uh, both. I now. think that might be what it means too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, joy. <laughs> no, no it'll, be, it'll be okay. We're just, uh, yeah. We're learning a lot this year and good God, I miss our volunteers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's very, very different. <clears throat> yeah, but it's good. We're running on caffeine and uh, and I don't know, just we're having fun and I'm wearing flip flops. I don't have to get dressed up, you know, from here down. So it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, okay, well, very good. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll see you yeah. tomorrow.
send me the link for that for tomorrow. Will do. Uh, eventually, uh, let me know uh, how this can be accessed uh, archivally. Yep. Uh, you know, as soon as I, oh, and actually I should stop now, but when I, when I press stop video, or stop, no, not stop video, stop recording, it'll send it into the cloud wherever those things live. Um, and I'll get a link for that and I'll send you the link. And then when it's on our website, I'll send you a link to that also. Okay, very good, very good. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. <laughs> All right, let me stop recording here.